So let's talk about the stable kernel tree. Um, please interrupt Heckle. This makes it fun. Uh, my last time I did this was about five years ago in front of a live audience, so let's see what happens. Um, I gave it to, I did this a while ago in front of just like four people and it crashed and burned. So let's see if this works better. Um, let's talk some history about the kernel development process. Let's forget everything before 19 years ago. That was a long time ago. I didn't, I didn't when did these numbers the other night? Um, 2.0 came out 19 years ago. Before that, we had a really weird numbering scheme with .09 for like a year and then 1.3 for some unknown reason. And anyway, 2.0, 1996 came out. So we said, hey, there's a nice stable kernel. Let's go off and do this. And then we split off and did a development tree four months later. We said, ah, oh, things good, nice and stable for four months, good enough for now. Let's do a development kernel and keep on going. Let's see what happens. Um, to do that, we said, okay, odd numbers are going to be development kernels. Even numbers are both stable. Nice, easy thing to remember. We had the idea that we could do both of them at the same time. Everybody was happy. But almost two and a half years, two, about two and a third years later, we actually got a stable kernel. So nobody had a stable kernel for over two years. And it was okay, because not many people were using Linux. This was about 1999. And 1999, 98, if people realize things got really, really popular around Linux. I got my first paying Linux job then. I'd been using it for a long time, and a kernel developer for a little bit before that. Um, a lot of people here got involved about the same time, and things got really popular. So we said, okay, great, stable kernel release, development kernel. Alan Cox took the stable kernel releases. Linus did the development kernels. And we started splitting things off. Four months later, we started going. We're like, all right, this is going to be good. And we did it better. About one and a, one and a third, one and a half years. No, one and a half years. We had another stable kernel release. 2.4. And everybody's like, yeah, Linux is great. Red Hat was doing really well. SUSE was doing well. OK. Um, <laughs> but they were around. Um, but right, so people started building products on Linux. People started supporting this in the enterprise industry. And people were really good. And they wanted lots more involvement. IBM came along and said they're going to invest a billion dollars in the kernel, which was crazy. But it really was a good thing because it, I think built, half of that was just advertisements. Um, maybe people know what Linux was. So 2.4. 2.4 came out and Marcel Tussati took along. The, he became the maintainer of that. And um, about a couple months after he took over, he grabbed me one day at, or when we were at the Ottawa Linux Symposium and said, look at my inbox. This is crazy. He was getting like a a couple hundred emails a day of patches. He didn't know what to do with it. Um, I looked last week. I averaged about 1,300 emails a day. So um, what I thought was crazy and other people thought was crazy a long time ago is nothing compared to what we do now. Although 1,300 is a lot. That's not mailing lists. That's email. Um, GitHub has caused a lot of problems with that. But anyway, 10 months later, we said, great. 2.4 is nice and stable. Marcel took it. And let's do 2.5. 2.5 is good. We're going to do lots of good development. Enterprise want all these enterprise features. We're going to have all this stuff. We're going to tick off. We're going to make it feature complete with Unix, compete with Solaris, compete with AIX, which it turns out we were already as good as. Um, and we were good. It didn't work. Almost three years it took us. And if anybody remembers these days, and they worked for a distro, who worked for a distro during these days? It was hell. It was really, really, really bad. We had to backport massive changes from the 2.5 kernel to 2.4. 2.5 was fun for me. I was just working on upstream development. Um, I broke the tree once a week doing the driver model. I swear. Me and Patrick, Michelle, Linus just let us run around and do whatever we wanted, um, which was insane. Um, I don't know what Linus was thinking. Um, but it was fun. But it took us three years to make a stable kernel. And everybody who went through this process, we, Red Hat's kernel went this way, Sousa's kernel went that way, and it was crazy. We had these weird backports for schedulers, for threading models. It was hard to support, really, really hard to support. So we said, let's never do this again. <laughs> we sat down at the kernel summit, which we came every year, and we said, let's never do this again. So this was 2003. 2.6, we said, this is going to be a stable kernel. We're not going to do development kernels anymore. But then how do we do development? And we came up with this model. So this is what we've been doing since then, so since 2003, long time. So we, Linus does a release, and I showed this last year, I gave this talk, and then for two weeks we throw patches at Linus, all the maintainers. He does an RC1 release, 
Then I see two, three, four, five, six. And it's bug fixes only after then. And it lasts about two to three months. He does another release, and off we go. And this was going well. We did this for about a year, two years, and everybody was happy, except for the distros. <laughs> and except for people who had to actually use these kernels, which was interesting. So the kernel is one of the very first projects that did time-based releases that I know of. I can't say we are the first, because I probably somebody else was, but we were one of the very first ones that did it. And we proved that it could work. It was very good because we have a really short time frame. We could say we wouldn't have this pressure to take this patch that was going to do this feature because we knew, oh, if you didn't make it this time, you can make the next one. If you do a longer time frame, like Wine does a release every year, which is crazy. You have to quick get those features in near the end of the year if you want to make it to make the next, you don't want to have to wait another year. Two to three months, everybody can wait that much. And it's worked. Um, we start off we say, at three months, Linus keeps making it shorter. Two and a half months right now, he wants to do two months. I think that's crazy, but all our development process is crazy. Um, let's see what we can do. It's really, it's fast. So this was going well, 2003, but 2005, people were hurting. And people said, Linus had a stable kernel, we need this stuff. And Linus did this email. I'll let you guys read it. Um, read the last sentence. This is the funniest. The second to last sentence, sorry. I'm not going to repeat that out loud. Um, he said that we, to make a stable kernel and to backport only specific patches is a really, really hard problem. It becomes, a, who do you, what do you pick? Who is going to do the picking? And the problem with, if you look at the distros, there's these APIs inside the kernel. Everybody doesn't want the APIs to change because they, want, they have something they rely on, except for the things that they care about. But when you deal with 500 different companies and 3,000 different developers, everybody cares about something different. So how do you say no to somebody and yes to somebody else? You need really strict rules. And Lena said, There's, this is an impossible thing to do. Nobody's going to do it. They're going to curse you out, and um, you're going to go crazy. So he said, who would want to do that? Me. <laughs> Not knowing any better. Um, I said, hey, I've been, trying, I've been working on this. So I was working at SUSE, uh, Stable Releases. Um, this is a tough problem that people had all the time. Let's try and do this. I said, I'll try and do this. I'll start this. Let's see if we can figure it out. And at the same time, a few minutes later, my friend Chris Wright, who was still working at OSDL then, said he would do it as well. Andreas Solomon thought he would do it, but he said no. So Chris and I started doing this. And it turned out we can do this. It, it works out really well. Um, Chris, though, went crazy and stopped doing this, and now he's the CTO of Red Hat. So much easier job. <laughs> He didn't go crazy in general, but he, it was, it's a hard problem to do. So it's a hard thing to do. So what we did is we did this. So Linus does a release, I fork. At that point in time, I'll do one, dot two, dot three, dot four, dot five. And we do these releases that way. And at the end, we throw it away. So we have a stable release, and it's really good, because people through this two to three month period, if they had state, if they had security fixes, if we did something obviously stupid, we didn't have a way to get it in a kernel or release. So now we can. So this is what we do. So this happened starting in 2005, and we've been doing it ever since. Nice and stable. Nice and repeatable, nice and interesting. So that was a stable kernel. Um, as a job, I worked for SUSE, and it turned out that my day job was maintaining the kernel. I could take one of these kernels, and I could do it in public. So we made something called a long-term kernel. And over the years, these have morphed in different ways, and this is the official policy now. Um, we pick one, I pick one a year, and I maintain it for two years. So right now I maintain the 3.10, 3.14, and 4.1 I've announced. It's going to be these long-term kernels. Um, we have synced up with different companies at times. 2.16 was interesting. That, um, all the distros released their kernel based on that one. 3.0 was nice. A number of distros based their kernel on that one. Um, my long-term kernels happen to be in sync so that I will never get a canonical release. Um, that was not picked on purpose. Um, this syncs up with the Android releases every two years. Um, Chrome every other, every three years. 3.14 was a big Chrome OS release. Um, 3.10 is still a huge Android release. There's new phones got announced yesterday. They're coming out on 3.10, which is crazy. But. What's your criteria to detect what is a good What is a good kernel? What is a good kernel to become a long-term? Um, I, uh, 
so one thing interesting is I can't announce them ahead of time. Because I've announced them ahead of time saying, hey, 3.10 is going to be the same one. This is the good kernel. Um, everybody throws crap into it. <laughs> and it's really interesting to watch. Because um, even though us as kernel maintainers, we, shouldn't only, we know we should accept things when they're right and when they're correct. But it turns out not. We're, we're like, hey, is this going to make my life easier? Let's throw it all in there. And we'll figure it out later. Um, the point is, you put the shit in which is not working. Oh, yes. Then it's only bug fixes That's right. That's what people will try. Um, some people actually get it right. So IBM threw in Power 8 support before the chip taped out, made it into a stable kernel release, and then did small bug fixes to get it working. IBM did it right. Um, other people didn't do it right, and it was a mess. I think the 3.0 what was a bad one. There was one really bad one. I think it's the one you're still maintaining. <laughs> no? Okay. No, there was one bad one a number of years ago. So I don't want to take it ahead of time, but I go around and talk to companies and try and see it. So 4.1 is interesting. Um, um, I went around and talked to a lot of companies and said, everybody said, yeah, 4.1 might be interesting and that would be good. So publicly they said, that's a wonderful kernel. Privately, almost every single one of them said, nah, we're not going to use it. <laughs> so it would be interesting to see what happens. Um, and then other companies say they will. Um, but I just randomly pick one. Um, right now I'm maintaining three um, because here's the time frame. Um, this is on kernel.org. If you kernel.org lists them all. And here's the people that maintain them. Uh, some people pick up them on their own. Uh, Sasha works for Oracle. He's doing that. Usually it works for Sousa. He's doing that because it works for him. Lee Zafan works for Huawei. And they had a bunch of products based on 3.4. So he just picked it up after me. Uh, Willie is the only other person to do one, more than one stable kernel release. Everybody else runs away. So you and me are the only crazy ones to do this. Um, and Ben is doing um, 3.2 because of Debian. That's Debian's kernel. He's doing a really good job there. Um, 3.16, I think, is being maintained by Canonical. Is it? Okay. So that's what the Debian, that's the next Debian kernel, right? 3.16? It's current. Uh, that's crazy. <laughs> Anyway, Debian's tough. So Ben has to maintain 3.2 for five years. Um, it's interesting. After about two years, patches stop applying to kernels, and they start getting really, really hard. Um, that two-year number used to be true about a couple years ago. As kernel development keeps going faster and faster and faster, um, that number gets interesting. So 3.10 actually got really, started getting really hard at the beginning of this year. Um, it's really tough <laughs> right now. Um, it's getting harder and harder for things to apply, backporting them properly, testing them is hard, keeping hardware around that still runs on some of this old hardware is interesting too. I have one box that runs 3.10 at home, and I want to get rid of it. So. Do they help? Um, here, I'll talk. Good segue. So how do you get patch and kernel? So what's the rules? I kind of did this a little bit out of order. So here's the rules of what we exact came to. So this has been hashed out over the years. Very simple rules. Um, rules are good so that we have something to say no with. So if I, you send a patch in and it doesn't look quite right, I say, hey, it looks it doesn't fit this. No. Um, there are things we've accepted that don't meet this criteria. SUSE has done a really, really good job of backporting a bunch of performance patches. Um, things were working fine before it, and they're working fine afterward. They just happen to be working faster afterwards, right? So I took that set of patches. That was well tested, well thought out, individual backports. So they were good. So that's so I did it. But mostly it's obvious bug fixes, things like that. And it must be in Linus's tree. Must be in Linus's tree is the most important thing. I don't want trees to diverge. I can't accept something in a stable tree that's not already in Linus's tree, which means I also accept bugs in my tree. I will take a patch that I know is broken because Linus's tree is still broken and nobody's fixed it yet. <laughs> um, sometimes it gets the maintainer to move faster. Sometimes it's better because then the fix happens in such a way that it applies in both places at the same time, in the same way. I want the patch to be identical. If you don't start collapsing patches, give it to me identical patch of what's in Linus's tree. Every time I take something that isn't in Linus's tree, I think about 50% of the times we get burned. It's that bad. It's really, really bad. So we know it works in Linus's tree. Take it, just backport. Give me all the patches up to that. Give me what's in Linus's tree. I don't want anything else. Um, yeah? 
And we get burned by the patches coming from security lists. Yes, we get burned. If we get security patches getting accepted into Linus's tree, and then I instantly release them in the stable tree, they haven't been tested yet. I like now testing them for a week in Linus's tree. Um, so yeah, I almost got burnt this week. <laughs> um, here's how you do it. So if you're submitting a patch to the kernel, you think this applies to the stable tree, just add CC stable in the signed off by area of the kernel. That's all you need to do. Don't copy the mailing list, don't do anything else. I have scripts that when it hits Linus's tree, I pick up the patch and it dumps into my mailbox. And I'll show you how those work in a minute. Um, or if it's already been in Linus's tree and you forgot to pick that tag, just send the get ID to the mailing list. Don't, and say which trees you want it applied to. Don't send it to just to me because there's more than one person. If you send it to just to me, I'll lose it in my inbox. Send it to the stable mailing list. Pardon me? So I'll do all the backporting. Um, no, I won't do all the backporting. <laughs> um, so when I get a patch and it doesn't apply to backport it, an older tree, um, and you say you think it should apply there, because I'll show you how you can mark patches to say how far back you should go, um, my scripts will send out you an email saying, this didn't apply. If you think it still should apply, send me a backport. And what, what if I don't then, then I ignore it. That's okay, because obviously you as a maintainer didn't think it was worthy enough to be applied. I can only do so much. Sometimes I will backport stuff. If I know it, um, if it's a security, if I know it's a security fix, or if it's something that's, hey, this is obviously easy because the file moved from this directory to this directory, I can just edit the text file and go. Uh, file movements, those are easy for me to do. Changing APIs, changing offsets, and stuff like that. A bug is a bug. But sometimes I know a bug is more of a bug. Yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes I don't. I, I, I would say because sometimes I expect this is true, but uh, the difference between already upload and a security bug is that the security bug can be done on your project. Yeah, the uh, security bug. It can make it more annoying than already upload, which will be on the ransomware. Right. We had a TTY bug fix that we fixed in the security, or that we fixed, um, and we thought it was just a normal bug fix. We got backported all the stable trees. Turns out, um, two years later, somebody figured out how they could get root on your box from it. Um, there was a ex perfect example of a normal quote, bug fix that distros didn't copy into their trees because they thought, hey, it doesn't matter that much. Boom, it was an issue. So a bug is a bug, but it can turn into worse. Um, so yeah, so I look at them and I see. So. <coughs> Am I doing what? Sorry? The, the, the network, uh, patches, uh, network patches. Because uh, that end, uh, they send them to you, uh, like uh, for still copying. Uh, yes. Still so networking is done different. Um, networking, um, David Miller batches them up for me and sends them to me. Um, he's the only maintainer that wants to do them on his own, but he doesn't backport it to all of them. So I take those, last, the newest ones he's given to me is 314, and I backport them where applicable. And sometimes I get them wrong. <laughs> um, so that's, networking's a little different. If you're sending network patches, don't add the CC. David will do it for you in his own tree, because he actually tests them for me. If you're a maintainer and you care, um, want to do this, please let me know and I'll work with you. Um, otherwise, just mark them. And um, maintainers have gotten better. Over 10 years, maintainers are doing much better. Thank you, Jens. Or, yeah, thank you, you're finally <laughs> getting better. Um, if it's any constellation, SCSI's the worst. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very low bar. That is a low bar. <laughs> um, I, so subsystem maintainers, when you're applying patches and you say, hey, this is obvious bug fix, new device ID, add the tag, and go. That's all you need to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it doesn't. So um, sometimes, so another tag you can put in the kernel is um, in the signed off by, you can say fixes. And you can say fixes and you give it a git commit ID. And I'll show you how my tools takes that tag and determines how far back to go. So sometimes you want to know, because if you know this fixes a specific patch that went previously, it will do that. Um, otherwise, you can say CC um, stable, and then at the end of that, you can put a, a tag and you can say this goes back to 3.0. If you know ahead of time. If you don't know ahead of time, just allow, we'll try and work it out. 
Um, but otherwise, look. Yeah, Ben actually hits us a lot because he hits Debbie and kernel patches. Um, he hits them and fixes them in their kernel, and then he forward ports the back port <laughs> and gives them to us. Um, ben does a, actually an amazing job. I really does a really good job. Uh, Yuji do, does a very good job as well. Both those guys are doing really well. Sasha is going crazy. I warned him ahead of time, and he's giving presentations now on how the process can be more automated and stuff. Um, anyway, I warned him. <laughs> Um, so the timing of how long it's in Linus's tree before it goes in the stable tree is basically up to my development cycle. Cycle. Um, ideally, now we have the rules. I want to see it in Linus's public RC release before I'll take it. Give it a week or two to bake. Um, realistically, based on my backlog, uh, it's at least one or two RCs before it gets into a stable kernel. Um, sometimes you can email me out of band to the stable list, say, "Hey, this really needs to go now." Um, the MD and the DM guys um, want things to be delayed. They want stuff to say, I want this in a real Linux, a stable release, and I, I want to wait three months before it goes into backported. Totally up to the maintainer. So yeah. So like the MD guys are now giving me tags saying, wait three weeks, which I can work with. Um, I, I've been telling them, just don't even tag them, and then just email me to get IDs when you feel it's good. That's easier for me to work with the maintainer. It's up to the maintainer. It's, a, it's your judgment call on how things go. And the developer who does it. Um, what if a bug is only uh, applicable to a particular release? Then it's the newest one only. It bug should never be applicable to older ones because it went into Linux history. Right? So sometimes bugs are only in 3.10 and not in 3.12, but usually it's because we fixed something between there. So find that fix and I'll backward to 3.10. Sometimes, yeah, people will do that. So they'll say, this git commit ID, please, it went into 3.12, went into 3.11, backward to 3.10. So that happens a lot. The 3.4 guys, um, Huawei does a really, really good job of digging up stuff because they're beating on their stuff. So they find a lot of patches that were fixed like in 3.8 and so they backward them now. Um, and the stable kernel rules.txt in the documentation tree goes into detail and description on all this stuff, much more. I'm going to do it. Then I summarized. Uh, read that file. It's pretty easy. Um, we have a review cycle. So once I do, I batch them all up. We send them all out to the world. And I give you, I used to give you 48 hours, maybe 72, before things go. And then I say, um, I do a release. So let's do that. Let's see if I can do this. Um, what am I going to do? So I keep all the patches in Quilt. Quilt's an awesome tool when you have a stable base. Um, I have the 4.2 kernel right here. And right now there are 30 patches queued up in here. So um, um, in the queue, I have a, a, if you know how Quilt works, Quilt is very powerful. There's a series file. And it lists what order to apply them all, but everything's good. So I have a script. So I have 30 patches right now. Um, I have to edit the make file by hand, which I already did. And then I have, let's see, I've automated everything. Um, so what this does, it checks out a clean version of the last tree, and then does quilt apply to them all, and then does get format patch, <laughs> and then generates a diff. And it makes a whole bunch of mailboxes. And it's going slow. Okay, give it a second. That's actually really slow. There we go. Okay. It signs it. And it's done. So I have patches, I have get scripts to tell me what to paste into my command line. 
It's a nice, safe way to do things. So in this directory, it shows I have 30 patches, 30 messages. I have a script called send everything off. And all that does is it calls kup, which is a tool that uh, we wrote to deal with kernel.org and sign binaries and keys and things like that. Uh, it'll send everything out, copies it up to kernel.org, sends up the s signature, and then uses get send mail on everything. Um, and here's all the patches in mailbox form, just to verify I got it all right. And I say, here's the start of the review cycle. Okay, I give you three since Saturday, October 3rd. Anything reviewed after this patch is too late. So that worked. So then I do, let's see if the network works. I sent it to kernel.org, and now it uses git send mail. And you guys all know what git send mail works. Boom. I just sent 31 emails. Maybe one email. Okay, it'll go in the background. So now I've started the, the 4.2 cycle. And you'll see one email that goes out like this, and there'll be a whole series. <coughs> Maybe by the time I finish, they'll show up on the public mailing list. So, pardon me? That was real. <laughs> <laughs> that was live. <laughs> so 4.2, um, what did I say it was called? 4.2.3 RC1 just got released. That was good. <laughs> so it's on kernel.org, and everybody's happy. Um, so there's some testers out there um, that we have. Gunter, who works for um, Juniper, has a box in his basement that takes all these patches, um, builds them on 40 or 50 different architectures and stuff like that, um, boots them on like 10 or 15 using QMU, and tests that. He does a really, really amazing job. Um, it's sad that I rely on somebody's machine in their basement, <laughs> but we do for testing a lot of the stuff. Um, there's some other current people that do maintain this stuff. Pardon me? Do they do testing? I've never seen a valid test from Pharaonics. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, if they do RC testing, great. Let me know that I didn't break anything. That'd be nice. Um, it'd be nice to know if I didn't break something. There's something in the last 4.1 kernel that's being a little flaky on networking, but people don't know if it's actually in Linux is true or not. So testing is good. I want to see testing. So that's how I do an RC release, and that's a little bit simpler than doing a real release. Yeah. Um, I do that because I hand edit the to and from using said. <laughs> so um, it uses quilt. I mix mess with quilt mail and get send mail and the mixture of the two. Uh, get send mail start off as a Perl script based on me. Um, so I'm pretty familiar with that. Um, so it's just a mixture of the two. All these scripts are public. They're on the tree. Um, ben actually looked at them and said they were too hard to work with. So your mileage may vary. Kernel to CS. You, you, but you send me patches. You send me results after I've done a release. Yeah. So it's a little bit too late. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. Here's one you can do. <laughs> Yes, so it is a random time. I give you three days, but yes. Um, but like Gunter um, ties into the quilt tree and picks stuff up. Like he tests every day. He'll run a, a test every day. Um, you can do that if you really want to. I don't know how fast your tests take. Okay. So he runs off triggers. I mean, you can trigger off Git pushes. So I have a, a quilt tree kept in Git on kernel.org. It's kind of complex, but um, that's the way it works. So, so that's questions about RC releases. What about the Git tree of the tagging? So that was just an RC release. There is no tagging. There is no Git tree of the patches applied, which causes people like kernel CI a nightmare. Um, but the reason I do that is um, now we have 30 emails out there. And sometimes, actually recently, for, the last, for this next kernel release I'm going to do in a minute, somebody said patch number 30 out of 100 is bad. We don't want that in here. It doesn't apply. Rip it out. And you can't do that with Git. If you have a whole bunch of patches already applied, I, I could rebase, 
but you never want to rebase a public tree. So that's the problem with quilt. I can just rip one down the middle and then do that way. So that's, that's why. I never recommend using Git if you're ever using a whole series of patches. Git is really, really good. It's what the distros use. As soon as though we were keeping 5,000 patches against the kernel piece of cake using quilt. Um, 5,000 patches. Yeah. Yes, you can do that. <laughs> and that's the way Gunter does it as well. Yeah. <laughs> right, no patches apply to old kernels. I forgot to actually apply patches. So yeah, that's good. I forgot. Okay, I wanted to apply two patches. So here's how I do patches. Uh, here's my inbox. If you don't want to see, that's a mess. Um, stable patches. So, um, like I said, if a, a patch hits Linus's tree with a stable tag, I get to see them. Um, I have a git hook that then just sends me an email directly, and it sends it in a common format. You can subscribe to the git send. What's the git commits? Git commits mailing list as well. All patches come through that. Um, I really recommend that if you want to see all the patches that come through here. So here's a patch by Lewis. Um, and he, in the signed off by, see here, down here it says CC stable. It also says fixes. And so my scripts in MUT can take that. And um, what key do I have there? It digs up the kernel tree and says, hey, that goes back to 315, RC1. That's when that patch showed up. So I said, oh, okay, I know how to do that. So I will apply this patch. So I apply patches. One key pulls up in an email. I strip off a tag. I look at the patch. Yeah, it looks good. I save it. <laughs> I looked at this ahead of time. <laughs> I looked at it ahead of time. Okay, it applied to the 4.2 kernel. Great. Applied to the 4.1 kernel with some offsets. Yeah, good enough. Um, I use Quilt and some patches, uh, some tools around Quilt that um, Chris Mason from Facebook wrote. And I refresh that and go, and then it does not apply to the four dot, or to the 314 kernel, which is kind of obvious because it didn't want to, and it doesn't apply to 310. And now I apply the patch. And let's do another one. So I'll show you two. This one um, from Kyle adds a new, it fixes the bug. Um, it doesn't, see, it's kind of small. It doesn't have a fixes by. So let's see where this applies to. Um, oh, 4.2, 4.1, not the 3.14. A whole bunch of hunks or fail. So I, I can use Quilt. I can force push it. I can edit it by hand and do fun things like that. I know it doesn't apply here. Oops. Delete. I can just stop it. So let's, so in my quilt tree, I have four, two new patches added, two new patches for 4.1, and two new patches for 4.2. Um, they apply, I would test build it, I know these work, you don't want to see my laptop try and build kernels. And then I run a script, I have, I have scripts I call do it all. <laughs> <laughs> But it really doesn't do it all because I have to do I have to pick a kernel number. So I wrote another script that just wraps around that called do everything. <laughs> do it really, and it goes through, it takes the patches, it commits them to the tree, it emails you who it is, and then it pushes it to the public um, location and it pushes it to a private repo I have. Um, and it sends out a bunch of emails. <laughs> Kernel.org. Pardon me? They never error out. <laughs> um, the only time things error out is when I can't like push to public the public repos or something. But I have actually now I have wrappers that make sure I'm online before it tries to push. Um, but kernel.org is interesting, and I just refreshed this. So kernel.org, there's two-factor authentication. 
on us. So if I try and push and I haven't done a two-factor authentication, um, it fails. So it just it will continue on just fine. And then I have to go back and manually push it and authenticate. So I did this earlier today. So I, I have 24 hours at this IP address in order to push patches. So you have the SS, we have my SSH key and my two-factor authentication. So I meant to do that before I sent that thing off. So now 4.2 actually has two more patches added, but we'll let that slide. Um, so we'll also release 4.1. Um, with those added two patches. See, that's a little bit faster. Because I do, I like doing it at the same time. That way I know I can come back and do the rest of them at the same time. This one's going to have 29 patches. I'll send it off. Send everything. And while that happens, let's update my email in the background to see if it actually came. So that's 4.1. What kernel is this going to be? .10 RC1 is out, and the 4.2.3 RC1 is out. Keeping four, four stable kernels going is not my max. It's hard. I can't do more than that. Um, that's why I don't pick them for longer periods of time. Three is, two is easier for me. Four is pushing my limits of keeping the balls in the air. It's just hard to do things. So, what do you mean? I'm sorry. What do you yes, it didn't apply to 3.14. Right. If I had to apply that, if it was supposed to go there, yeah. I would. Um, I have a script that says um, it's called bad stable. <laughs> um, that I provide the git commit ID, the kernel version of the git commit ID, and it emails the people all about it and says this doesn't apply. That's the thing. Uh, please send it back for it, or I'll do it by hand. Most usually, I just run that, and then I have another one. That's called that. <laughs> um, that is like, what in the world are you doing trying to apply this, send this to a backport? Um, I have hit that lately with a bunch of InfiniBand patches. Uh, SCSI guys woke up and tried to backport major features, like 500 patch line patches. And I'm like, no way. I'm not going to do that. So we have both these type of, type of scripts. Um, yeah. So that's me yelling. Linus told me I had to be meaner, so I'm finally meaner. I have a script that is mean for me. <laughs> I wrote the message I said. <laughs> I, yeah, I wrote it. So it isn't as mean as it probably should be. But, okay. um, yeah. So let's see. Yeah. 4.2.3. This is public. It's out there. Um, so let's do a release. So, so 3.10 and 3.14 are due. I think I said, when did I say they were going to have to be done by? Um, the first at 14, oh, it's a couple hours off. It's right here is the date. OK, let's do the release. So these are on the quilt tree. Again, I pop everything off. I want a clean tree. That's much faster. So all I have is a make file that's different. And ah. um, give me a name. Do we name kernels? Uh, kernel recipes. Kernel recipes. Ah, I can't spell, can I? There we go. <laughs> kernel recipes. All right. How about a date? I'll give it. Nice. All right. The kernel gets a name. Um, it's 
three, fourteen. So all the patches again are kept in the git tree. So I say quilt git quilt import all these patches. I think there's only two users in the world of git quilt import, me and one Debian developer. Um, it barely works for us. Um, it's a very, very fragile script. Hmm? You're using it now because of me. I think, okay, so I'm making other people use it. It's very fragile, isn't it? It breaks all the time. Um, it's a scary little script. Let's see. Yeah, it worked. Good. <laughs> so it goes through the tree. It applies all the patches to the Git tree. This is Git being slow. It's a whole bunch of networking patches. Reverted something. Oh, and the NMI fix. So there's a CVE that finally got fixed for 3.14. Um, and it's, it was 83 patches. That seems, is that how old are yours? Yeah, 83 patches. Okay. So I should script this. And Chris Wright used to script this a little bit better. But I got scared. So we commit the make file change. And we tag it. I still do this part by hand. I don't, I tag it, I have a script. I tag it, do you really want to tag this? Yes, it's tagged. Great. Um, do release, I, I, my scripts are named dumb things. I want to release this. So for kernel.org, um, I don't want to upload a whole release. It's huge, right? The kernel is, I don't know, compressed file is big. Um, let's see, how big is it? The tar file is 500 meg. I don't want to have to upload that across the random web link because um, I'm on ferries, I interconnect. Internet's not so good. So what we have is on kernel.org, we want to see a git tag. So we sign a release, and kernel.org, if I say do a release of this git tag, and it matches this SHA-1 of everything, and it will do that. So it checks it out on kernel.org, compares the signature, and then builds the tarball based on that. We sign the tarball, we don't sign the compressed tarball. We sign tarballs because we've changed our compression formats over the years, I think we dropped EZ2, maybe, we added a new one. Um, so that's a good thing. If we sign a tarball, that's future proof. As long as the tar format is deterministic. And it wasn't always. We found some bugs in Git um, that it was not deterministic for some really long path names. Um, there's some incompatibility between the BSD tar and the GNU tar, and now the Git tar. Hopefully we've worked all these out. And we'll always make a deterministic tarball that you can do for different versions of Git at different points in time, and you get the same thing. Um, so I need to push it to, to kernel.org. I'm on the 314 branch. See, this is still done by hand. So when people like Willie will send me a pull request, they say, pull and do a release. So what I do is I suck it into my tree right here. I pull in the tag. I verify it actually matches up. I GPG check it. And then I will push it to Perl.org. So I still have to push the git tree, but that's only 84 compressed patches. Um, 9,400. There goes the tag. And that's done. So it doesn't do a release, it just puts it in, a, in the repo. So in the kernel.org Linux stable repo, the release is there. Now I need to actually update, upload it. And the upload script is kind of messy. Uh, we run kup. So kup, we want to say it's a tar file, here's the prefix you want to give it, put it in, it's in that location for the git tree, it's this tag, here's the GPG signature, and put it in that location. <laughs> it's a mess, but it works. And then we do the same thing we want to upload the change log, the patches, and the patches. Um, so that's it. So that, that takes a little while. Why do you know that it's 3.0? Why is it? Oh, is it still 3.0? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so on kernel.org, we break things out in pub Linux kernel 3.0, and there's 4.0, there's 2.0, there's 4.0. So that's just a breakdown of the directory location.
So yeah. Um, I think we finally have Fordo though. My scripts still work with the two, <laughs> the long, the older ones too. So the scripts that generate these are messy, but this saves me lots of time. So we upload it. This usually takes a little while. It should give me something back in a minute. If it errors out, it'll error out really early, so it succeeded. Um, like I can't find the tag. I find it interesting that uh, you are generating scripts. Uh, that generate scripts. Just generate scripts because, for example, the code reporting to the uh, or web generating. I suppose it helps you uh, recover on uh, errors or whatever, maybe, or maybe it avoids some mistakes. Yes. So yeah, scripts that create scripts. It used to be scripts that created, just printed them out as, print, as echoes and I cut and paste, but now they actually export to another script. So here goes, um, this script lies um, on kernel Berg XZ compression. We do not get an incremental, we don't know how long it goes. So it doesn't output, so it says 100%. It's really doing it now. GZ is happening. Um, I can take kernel.org um, to its knees, the back end, if I do four at once. Um, kernel.org is pretty interesting. The key signature of all the packages and all the files is done on a Raspberry Pi. Because <laughs> it's on a write-only, uh, it's on a read-only uh, media, it takes the key off it, does the signature, and copies it somewhere else. Um, there's a really good presentation from Constantine, the kernel.org sysadmin, that explains how everything works. It's a very robust system and it works really nicely, but a Raspberry Pi is kind of a little tiny bottleneck. Um, very few people actually hit this part of kernel.org's back end, so it's, it takes a while. It's just very different from what kernel.org, yes. Um, this whole way we upload, before I would just copy files directly into an FTP location and be done with it, because we had 400 users that could write anyway. <laughs> um, now it's very few people can upload. Uh, for the stable kernel people, it's, I think it's just me. I can upload, so other people, Willie, will send, go do this release. I run my scripts and I do the release. In fact, it's a lot because it's scary because uh, I did some huge uh, mistakes uh, with me in the community of the machine, uh, the other stuff which I did. I completely destroyed the Google Scorpion repo. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah, it's kind of, yeah. Things are much better now that kernel.org is, is interesting. Um, okay, now that works. So now the SHA one for the tarball was logged. We log everything with write only tapes or some type of media. That's what's going on. Um, it's all out there. Change log is done. We actually have to upload that. That's not too long. Bad. It compresses that and it goes. So then we have to email the world. That something happened. So I've almost automated that, but not quite. Um, what kernel did I release? 314. So I copied the last email I wrote. <laughs> so my scripts create an email. <laughs> oh, you can't see. Yeah, so you send an email to me. <laughs> So if you wonder why the wording is identical all the time, it's because the script created it. So here's the email saying, ah, 314.54 is now released. It can be found at this location. Here's the change log. Wonderful. Let's email that out. Uh, let's sign it. Boom, signed. And then we, oops, we will, oops, I did it right. I will send the patch. And that's it. So now, if you guys are subscribed to the kernel.org announce mailing list, um, it'll show up in about five minutes. The back end the kernel is released, it has to sync it out to the front end and split everything out. Um, I got a lot of emails right now because that's the release I was just, the RC releases I was doing. Uh, let's delete all duplicates. Um, so here's the emails I sent out earlier. So here's an email saying, I applied the ZRAM patch to the 4.2 kernel, and I applied it to the 4.1 kernel, and I applied the HPWMI patch to the 3.4.1 and 4.2. And here is the RC2 kernel, or 4.2 kernel. Here is the 4.1 kernel, RC cycle. 
And then my email server only syncs every five minutes because I try and rate limit myself. <laughs> um, and the kernel, the other thing will be out there. Yeah, it's not there yet. So give me five minutes and the other, the public release will be out there. So 3.14.54 with, let me make sure. With the right, yep. With the right name, kernel is now released. And that's it. I did it live. I didn't break. <laughs> So questions on how I could automate this better. <laughs> so just, yeah. Uh, I think one person in the whole house is how you make sure that you are not forgetting a patch. How do I make sure I'm not forgetting a patch? There's a lot. So my, I have one mailbox for all my stable patches. Um, right now it's 430 emails in there. Um, Really, according to sync up with Linus, all, there's 114 patches I haven't applied that maintainers have tagged for stable. So I need to catch up with these, and then I catch up with all the other mess. Um, sometimes there's some duplicates in here. Um, I also read all the patches that get sent to the email to Linus's tree. Uh, like here's the mailing list that, that anybody can subscribe to. I do briefly go over these, and if I think that should be applied, I I dump it over another mailing list, and I just go through that mailbox. And that's how I know if something has or has not. But once I mail off, if I say, maintainer, please take care, uh, this should be applied, it's now onto you, and I forget about it, because I got the short-term memory of a squirrel. Um, I can't do it anymore, because <laughs> I have to do so many. Um, but yeah, but it's all down to email. So it's managing email this way. Um, there's a bunch of patches in here that I need to apply. Some things people are saying, like here's a backport. Um, here's a patch for PowerPC that I said did not apply. Paul backported it and said, here, please apply this. And so things like that. So. Anything else? Questions? So how often do you find the patches are fixing the upload by rewriting the entire piece of code so there is a simple fix? Rarely. Very rarely, thankfully. Um, Every couple of months we'll have one, um, but if I'm doing about, I average about 100 patches a week, maybe 150 patches a week, of stable kernels. I try and do a stable release cycle once a week. Um, so it's pretty, it's not that bad anymore. Um, people incrementally fix things usually. Um, there's some subsystems that are worse than others. The target subsystem is notoriously horrible. Um, they're doing a lot of weird stuff. Um, but Regressions. So um, you email and say, hey, this patch caused a problem. And I say, wonderful, this patch is also in Linus's tree. You fix it up there and then send me the git commit ID. No, because almost always if I apply something that breaks something, it's also broken in Linus's tree. Either I didn't take another patch that Linus has, and I'll backport that one, but because I try and stay identical, the fact that if I break something that isn't also broken upstream or already fixed upstream and just another patch is really, really rare. And it turns out enforcing that it has to be in both places has saved us so many times. In the beginning when we were taking patches, like, oh, I rewrote this or I collapsed these three, then we started having problems. And that's why we have a strict enforcement now. Um, it's actually pretty rare. I mean, distros. So Facebook told me publicly, I could say this, the 3.0, no, where are they running? 3.10. Um, every single stable release, they ran through their machines, and they're running on production, no regressions. And what am I at? I'm at, what is 3.10 at now? It's a big... Yeah. Because, uh, in fact, uh, as you know, I, I scan uh, 10 versions uh, at once. Yes. And, uh, it's very, very, uh, 
So um, there it is, so 310.89, so 80, well, so they just told me a couple months ago, so say 70, 75 releases of stable releases with no regressions in an enterprise type system in a huge, huge environment. So I think we're doing something right. <laughs> it's working well. Do you make a check um, about the five C's are full time? Because it's not because it's not fine. Yes, I, I do build them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I didn't, I knew these applied and I test built them last night. I didn't want you guys to have to sit through my laptop trying to build stuff. Um, but again, other people also apply them and build them on all the other stuff, so like kernel CI, and then Gunter does it, and builds and boots a lot of different configurations, a lot of different architectures. We have, over the years, fixed up almost all the architectures to actually build. There's some architectures that don't build because people don't care about them. And I think we're up to a hundred and some different architectures and sub-architectures that build with no regret, no failures now. Yes. Yeah. Another hard thing is I see the patches when they hit Linus's tree, and I got an email per patch, but it doesn't tell me what order they were applied in. <laughs> so um, I have to guess. Um, I do guess by, I will look at the patches and say, okay, September 7th, September 11th, September 22nd, September 11th, and I look at the date and the time, and I try and apply them in the right order. Um, that's a pain. Um, Andrew Morton will copy me when he sends stuff to Linus, so here's three patches that I need, that he applied, sent to Linus um, that I need to, so there I have a hint as to what order they were applied in, and I use that hint to now, sometimes, these are three independent patches, it's not a big deal with that. Um, I do also look at patches that are hard, if you touch like mm.h or schedule.h, I try and do that the la at the end of my development cycle so I don't rebuild the world, it's hard. So, there's not much magic, it's just applying patches, emailing people out, and scripts that generate scripts that I run. <laughs> and they're horrible scripts. I'm not a good bash broker. Um, so I file things away. So I file things, like all these patches go to one mailbox, and then I'll sit down and say, great, I'm going to spend three hours right now and do stable kernels. <laughs> and I go through them, apply them. If it's easy, like those two, boom, applied, boom, applied, wonderful, builds, everybody's happy, those are simple. Um, every couple weeks I'll get a series of patches that are hard. They apply, I know I need to apply them, and they break something, or something isn't fitting in right, or they manually need to do that. And that's what breaks my workflow, and i got to sit down and do some real work. <laughs> and it's hard. Otherwise, it's just manually going through them and looking at them and applying them. And I can do that about once a week, three hours, four hours, for a normal thing. Um, it's not that bad, so I divide it up. Um, otherwise, sometimes, like if I'm on planes, I'll take, because this is really easy to do offline, I can sync everything up and push it all out. People see that, I've landed, and all of a sudden, boom, a whole bunch of email comes out. With Wi-Fi and airplanes now, it's kind of bad because they, they trickle out. I need to not get the Wi-Fi on the email on the airplane. But, yeah, so about once a week, three or four hours. Um, companies ask me how to do this because um, they want to do it, because uh, they want to maintain kernels, because they maintain stuff inside. And I say the resources needed is about one senior person full-time to devote to it because I'm just looking and going through things that other people tag. And whatnot. Now, I'm not caring about what my particular use case is. I'm trying to look at general. If you look at specific stuff, you need to care whether you do want to backport a patch or do not. 
You have to apply a little more care. You might dig through change logs for some things to see if they fix something that you shouldn't, that they didn't mark for stable and do that. So one senior engineer full-time is good enough to maintain a company. Uh, finding that senior engineer is kind of hard. Um, companies try and put junior people on them and they burn out and fail every single time. Um, I've seen it happen many times. Um, one other little thing, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it um, with Willie this week over alcohol. <laughs> we, need, we have too many long-term stable kernels. Um, what are we averaging now? That's a lot of stable kernels. Um, this past year we had 318, the canonical guys sneak in there and do two a year as well. It confuses the heck out of companies. They don't know what to do. Um, you're talking about this tomorrow. Um, I, since nobody else who ever has done a stable kernel wants to do another one again, I'm going to stop accepting other people to do stable kernels and just for long-term kernels and just do one a year. And that makes things better. It might not line up with your company's work as easy. Um, Sasha has documented how much extra work it actually has caused him. It would have been easier just to do it all with an Oracle. Um, somebody offered to do some 3.0 work in the back of the room there, or 4.0 work, and it's much easier for you just to do it inside your company. I, I appreciate the gesture, but um, I don't want to waste your guys' time. So that would confuse people even more. Why 4.0, why not 4.1? <laughs> Let's just do one kernel, long-term kernel year. And um, we're going to talk about the kernel summit in Korea in a few weeks as well. So. I think it's important as well to convince the store maintainers uh, to try to, uh, to uh, adjust to your kernels and not uh, use the parallel work they are doing right now. Because, uh, for example, Ben is doing a really great work, yeah. but he's doing it in parallel, and he really benefits from his skills and efforts. Yeah, that'd be nice. Um, I don't like telling community people what they can and cannot do. <laughs> um, I've tried to work with distros. Um, I think we're kind of past the age where people care about distro kernels. SUSE has proven, Oracle has proven that you can roll forward a kernel release in the middle of your enterprise, release our maintain, maintenance cycle, and nobody notices. And that's a very powerful thing. And I strongly, strongly recommend companies just keep updating their kernels and their products. Um, Android One guys at Google are trying to unify the Android kernels and are looking at doing the same thing. So they'll push new kernel updates to your phone. And I've been working with those guys on how to do that properly. I think that's the best solution in the long run than picking its odd random number and try and maintain it for long periods of time. SUSE and Oracle has done it. SUSE specifically has done a really good job in proving that this can happen. Nobody notices and everything works well. And that's based on the rule of, in the kernel community, we don't break user space APIs that people notice. <laughs> we, don't, we break things, but if you don't notice, nothing broke. <laughs> um, and that's a guarantee we've given to the community for the past 20 years, really for the past 10 years, um, but we really enforce it. We only have one rule, that's the rule. If you see Linus yelling at people, it's because we broke the one rule we have and meant it. Because I can break the API accidentally and go, oops, sorry, I fixed it. If you break it on purpose, then we'll yell at you. And that's fine. That's to be expected. Yeah? It's a point that we saw that you did the release on your kernels, but how does it all the materials not make a stable release? Like, does that touch to you? Or do they have their own system? So I, so they do the releases, that, all my tooling's public, so my scripts are public and they can use them or not. I think Yuji uses my patch, my scripts. Ben does not, I don't know what Willie does, because he's a little bit older. Um, but they make, they do the RC release, um, they announce them, they send the emails out, but then they create a git tree, and then they send me an email that says pull this tree, I pull it, I generate, I do that last, that do release script, I generate the tarballs locally, I push them up to kernel.org and it does that. So I'm the point, focal point to kernel.org. They're the focal point for actually announcing it to the world and managing the patches. So we work together that way. Or it's not easier that way. And I think, yep, the kernel got released and kernel.org announcement said it did. So it happened. It worked. I didn't break it. All right. Well, thanks a lot. That time's right.